Hey, this is Dan from MSS Enduralis. Welcome to the channel. You don't know anything about what's coming. The people were eating out of the garbage cans, sleeping on the street, any place that they could sleep. They had a blanket they could spread in the bus station, train station. They would spread it in a corner, any place they could see. That's where they would spend the night. With no money. I had heard this commotion out in the hallway one time, and uh, it was winter, and this family was being evicted out of the building. Uh, they had two children, and we used to play with the kids, and uh, they were the same age. And I went downstairs with my cousin, and uh, here was all their furniture out on the sidewalk, right on the edge of the street, not on the street, but right on the curb, where people could still walk by, but there, I remember seeing their dressers and their uh, couch and different pieces of furniture and the two kids were sitting up on top of one of the dressers and it was snowing and I said my mom came down and I said mom what's going on and she said well they're they couldn't pay the rent you know they're they got evicted We uh, suffered a little bit in the depression for lack of food. Food was scarce. Our, uh, the four uh, adults weren't working. My mom found a job uh, working in a hot dog stand and she was able to bring uh, some of the buns home and once in a while some of the hot dogs. But my uncle uh, did menial labor now and then and he uh, was able to bring home some food. I can remember my uncle getting some of the older potatoes from the Mark guy downstairs that we got to know uh, and bringing them up and making a potato pancake for us. And we were lucky to get an onion in it ground up, but he would make a, a good potato pancake. And uh, us cousins would sit on a towel on the center of the living room floor. We didn't have much furniture. And uh, that's what we had to eat for the whole day. In the city, you had to buy everything you eat. Everything you eat, you had to buy. We're all probably familiar with these stories and images from the Great Depression. But it's an often forgotten fact that many of these heart-rending accounts have a common denominator. Location. The city, but they had food lines and, and people would have to, I don't know how often they went or what they got, but it, it kept them alive and we didn't have that problem. We always had, um, things on the shelf and even now when I shop I got more on the shelf than I probably you know eat. We were a very poor depression family but we lived on a farm and we had food and they canned and uh, I can remember them getting up in the middle of the night to uh, put wood in the fire always on a wood on a, on a wood stove. Uh, they're just as poor as we were we were a very self-sufficient happy family.
What would happen to this nation if some event or series of events plunged it into a depression like 1929? What would be different now? Would it hit us harder than it hit them? Are we more vulnerable than they were? Back in the Depression era, a little more than half of America lived in an urban area, a city. Now that number has skyrocketed to around 80%. And as a sure result, we become much more dependent for our necessities of life. Take food, for instance. During the Depression, one out of every five people in the workforce were involved in agriculture. Now the number that produce our food is only slightly more than one percent. At first blush, this appears to be a good thing. But the only way this has happened is through major dependence on heavy equipment, fuel, chemicals, and other products which may or may not be available to the farmer in hard times. Without these modern devices and products, would our food system be able to produce enough food for the more than 300 million people in this country? And even if the farmers can produce enough food, are we assured that it will make its way to our grocery shelves and that we will be able to buy it? And you need to know that in our large cities, there's about three days supply of food. Now those supermarket shelves may look really full, and they are, because when you're taking it off, the clerks are stocking the shelves. And if they didn't stock the shelves just at the rate that you take it off without a panic, all those shelves would be empty in about three days because the trucks need to keep running to keep those shelves full. What if the trucks didn't run? There are a number of things that could, could bring about situations where there could be really serious uh, civil unrest in the cities. Manufacturers, um, they make to order. And so when the order comes in, that's when they manufacture. A lot of manufacturers just don't warehouse anymore. Again, that's money. So having product tied up in a warehouse is money sitting there. And they aren't to tie up their money like that. The stockholders don't like to see that. But that supply, if you had a disaster anywhere in one of these major manufacturing areas, it would stop the trucks, it would stop trucks coming in with the supplies, it would stop trucks from going out to supply your major chains. And the major chains have their warehouses, and again, that product is turning over and over daily. And so it's not like they have half their warehouse full of flour. Um, flour has a certain slot within that warehouse. And to keep flour in that slot, they have to have trucks coming in all the time to replenish that. So you stop those trucks, you stop the supply of products to the stores. Um, you know, one of the things I think of is, is in the event of a disaster, what do people do? They flock to the stores. They buy up all their staples and water. So your, your store will be empty faster than it's ever been empty before. Unfortunately, though, food is not the only problem. Beyond the well-known issues of air pollution and water pollution, I think today an even larger concern uh, relate uh, to the uh, political and the social arena. Uh, I think we have all, as Americans, have been aware since 9-11 uh, 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 that the cities are going to be the targets for terrorists. The terrorism involves not only destructive weapons, but bioterrorism. One of the uh, experts in this area, who was in the Pentagon, oh, this was about eight, ten years ago, uh, told me that if the average citizen knew the potential for mischief in this area, that they'd be really frightened. Uh, just one little example is smallpox. Uh, 
Nobody's vaccinated for smallpox. I was, I have a scar for smallpox, but only people who are near my age, I'm 82, my next birthday, are gonna have a scar for the smallpox vaccination. And as the smallpox got loose, and it was only, there were only two sources of that, uh, of, of that uh, uh, organism. One was in the Soviet Union and one was in this country. And I am told with considerable assurance that the one in the Soviet Union has gotten loose and it's now in China, it's now in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different uh, countries. A rural area is not a fruitful area for terrorism. The terrorists are going to be looking for the biggest bang for their buck they can get, the highest yield of death. And that's exactly why they mention such things as malls and uh, stadiums and where there are going to be large concentrations of people. But there are other major biological threats outside of terrorism. The most recent example, of course, was the, uh, the bird flu. And uh, while I was at the uh, Hanford site, we, we were making preparation for what we would do if there were massive outbreaks of the bird flu. And uh, at that point, we were even planning on how we would handle the large number of people who could possibly become infected, uh, the fact that the hospitals would immediately be overwhelmed, what buildings and sites could we use to quarantine perhaps hundreds of people, and what we would do as a medical team uh, to deal with this public health uh, uh, national emergency and crisis. And uh, so there again, uh, outside of uh, anthrax, uh, this has been another recent lesson for us to look at uh, where it's very much a possibility and not just something of science fiction. The more people there are around, the faster this epidemic will spread. If you're not in the cities, you're just by, by distance and space. You are have some meaningful measure of protection. As disconcerting as bioterrorism and the pandemic threat is, one factor has contributed more to the utterly dependent state of this nation than any other. Electricity. If you just think today about the world we live in and all of the creature comforts we have, you will recognize that essentially none of them would be there without electricity. It is the, the power source for almost everything out there. Uh, you can't communicate. Uh, if the electrons don't flow in your car, the, uh, uh, the gasoline won't explode in the cylinders and you won't go down the road. So if you cut off the flow of electrons in our world today, it's just a whole different world. And the grid upon which we depend for almost everything uh, is, is very vulnerable. Uh, it has been, it is just at the tipping point is the way that the experts will characterize it. Our demand has, has grown and the grid has grown just barely enough to keep up with demand. And it is really almost a Rube Goldberg kind of thing. And um, the least little perturbation can bring parts of the grid tumbling down as happened in Florida not very long ago. The great Northeast blackout of several years ago. A tree limb fell on, on a wire out in Ohio and caused a great blackout half a dozen years or so ago. Any little thing can, can bring down large parts of, of the grid. It is very vulnerable to terrorists. Uh, I am told that there are a dozen substations in the country that are so critical to the function of the grid that if terrorists took out those dozen substations, the grid would come down and could have events in the future where the power grid will go down and it's not in any reasonable time coming back on. For instance, if when the power grid went down, uh, some of our large transformers were destroyed, damaged beyond use. Uh, we don't make any of those in this country. They're made overseas and uh, you order one and 18 months to two years later, they will deliver it. Uh, our power grid is very vulnerable. It is very much on the edge. Our military knows that. 